Hi everybody, I'm Ben Komloshi. I'm co-founder of the Architecture for Refugees and Architecture for Refugees Rights uh, NGO. And I'm going to be the host of today's uh, Facebook Live uh, discussion about the topic of architecture is a human right. Mm. So in a very few seconds, I would like to talk, introduce and involve you to, to, to get to know our movement and our, our goals. So our, we, we say, we state architecture is a human right. We started this uh, movement in collaboration with two other organizations. One of them is the Emergency Architecture and Human Right. And the other one is the World Architects. Uh, on the World Architects page, we developed a, a manifesto where we mostly the emergency architecture and human rights started to uh, state a, a, a statement, a manifesto connected to the human rights and connected to, to architecture. I think you should check it. You can find it on the World Architects webpage. And this is something like this, the intro. Uh, hi, Pedro. I will, I will uh, add you in a few seconds. So about human rights, uh, this year we are uh, celebrating, let's say, the 70th uh, anniversary of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And because of this reason, I brought again a book, uh, this book, this time Architecture and Human Rights. And just like a few sentences from the book, the Universal Declaration provides a setting of common standards for legal achievement and we could consider it a template against which every system of law will be measured. Finally, its words and sentiments have become the lingua franca of how people should be treated. At the same time, the concept of human rights is continually evolving through countries worldwide, recognizing and codifying new human rights or clarifying the content of existing standards. So I think this is what we also try to do, uh, to, to recognizing new standards or new human rights such as architecture. Uh, our guest, so this is the book. Our guest today, tonight, is Fedro Neto. Uh, and let's be uh, serious or like i don't know uh, i have no clue about pedro i, I checked his website uh, and it looks interesting and i read a few like short uh, sentences about his work but why is he here tonight because let's say a friend of him just uh, wrote this about his uh, his way of thinking this guy studied with me in the oporto faculty of architecture but around mid-course started heavily focusing on anthropology and filmmaking. We had our differences once, mostly because I was an idiot back then, but this guy has a spine and he's really good at what he does. His, pa his path took him into the foray, foray of human rights and his background in architecture and filmmaking could make for an interesting guest for your Facebook Live series. Uh, I think this, this very short like intro is really enough uh, about Pedro to, to make him like an interesting guy. And then if you go to his website, you can read more about, you can watch his films and so on. So I think uh, this is the reason why you are here, Pedro. And I'm really, really waiting for your uh, thoughts and for your, uh, let's say, thoughts, feedbacks, whatever, about architecture, about human rights about anthropology. Uh, he also writes articles, uh, do research on Angolan refugees in Zambia. Uh, so yeah, we will see in a few seconds he's joining us. Mm, just a second. Uh, Pedro, I cannot add you, so please try to do something. Uh, I see that you are watching. So uh, please check the previous episodes on our YouTube channel, Architecture for Refugees. Uh, you can find it and we already have like three uploaded uh, parts. The first one is a kickoff event, it, there was only me. And then on the second, uh, it's Cyril Hanape, it's a French architect and Emilio Bandau, he's a, a Portugal architect living in Sweden. Uh, I can I still cannot add you, Pedro. Um, you can also follow us, Architecture for Refugees, on Facebook, on Instagram on YouTube and we also have a newsletter. So please let us know if you wish to, to get newsletters on a weekly basis. And uh, please do share uh, our projects and our pages on, on, in your network because it's very important uh, to reach out even more people and, and to change as Pedro's uh, friend wrote, uh, 
uh, he, he has changed people's mind and, and turned them into the direction of anthropology and architecture. If you have any questions during this free, uh, this free Facebook Live uh, uh, sessions, you can always ask these questions in the comments. And uh, see you also on the next week, hopefully. Uh, we will have on the 11th or 12th of December someone who is a women, woman and who is fighting for our, our other women's like basic human rights. So that's it, the very first slide. I would like to invite now Pedro. Hopefully still, I still cannot add him, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about books. Uh, almost every week uh, we bring some books and our guests bring some books and they are always very like uh, popular, let's say. And uh, so this week I also brought this book. Uh, it's about um, it's about refugee situations in the Western Sahara. It's a book by Manuel Hertz, Lars Müller publisher. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to know more about. I still cannot add you, Pedro. And then uh, I always want to highlight the Funambulist magazine. Mm, it discusses several issues, political uh, architecture or space, politics of space and bodies. That's the subtitle of the magazine. And, and there is always a book, which a, a map, sorry, a map, which also always shows the most interesting articles going to be published in that part. And, and now I was looking for some articles about uh, the African continent. And uh, so there is a lot of articles about, of, about situations like Mayot. Uh, Cyril Hanapi also talked about Mayot two weeks ago. And uh, so I think it's very interesting to check what is Mayot and what, is, what does it have to do with France. And then, uh, of course, Kenya, it's always coming back, the Dadaab refugee camp, Kenya and Somalia. Uh, and there's also a lot of articles about Algier and Libya and uh, yeah, so the African countries, Kenya as well again. So uh, let's see if Pedro is available, still not available. Uh, yeah, we had also some technical issues while we were checking his, if he can join us. If you have questions in the meantime, I would say uh, please do ask questions since we have now a bit of uh, technical time uh, about last week's or, or how to, I don't know, what to do, how to do. Um, okay, I still cannot add Pedro. It's crazy because, um, yeah, we always try to, do, to manage it and, and try it previously and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. What else? Mm. I don't know if you already checked the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There is like uh, around 30, 40 articles about it. One of them is the freedom, another one is about community. Okay, I can add Pedro, so... Let's see if he can join second. And then we can talk with him. That would be even more interesting than me talking alone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's, it's working. <laughs> Hello, Ben. How are you? Hello. Fine, thanks. So, uh, yeah, we had this very short intro. And uh, as I also mentioned <laughs> there, I don't know too much about you. So it's, uh, you're really, it's now it's like in a circus. Now you're going to be like the, the main character. And I'm going to just ask sometimes uh, maybe clever, maybe stupid questions. But now it's please start just from anywhere. The topic is architecture, human rights, and what is your work? How do you work? What is anthropology for you? And what is architecture for you? Well, first of all, I apologize, but yeah, technology, I usually say that the future is analog and though we have this technology, I think we at some point in time will realize that the, there are some things that uh, were better or work better in, uh, in real life. But still, just answering because I could not follow all your introduction because I was trying to connect and see how it worked. But um, with regard to Sergio, this was quite funny, actually. And, and I was perhaps also an idiot by then. We are all 
all the needs when we are 20 or when you are when you're teenage when we are teenagers so it's fine like we we neutralize the our idiocy <laughs> as uh, as time goes by or at least that it would be great that this is what i'm saying is true even in most circumstances um but but yes i you you sent me a sort of uh, uh a list or a set of questions that could be useful for our for our debate and for not 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 to lose track of what is the purpose of also of this discussion i mean i i i struggled with with some of them actually and so just and for I, the for the audience uh, there are like questions of freedom in architecture and uh, such things so this these questions that are always sent to the guests are very like super <clears throat> generic so it's really not about uh, answering these questions it's more about having having a kind of very basic thing so that's yeah uh, maybe i will post it in the next weeks also these questions so that the audience will also know what it's like that. okay like, oh, yeah, in, indeed those are quite general questions but they are nevertheless very useful to understand uh and not to lose the focus because of mm -hmm. course this is a huge uh field of discussion but let me uh, trying to answer to what you have asked me with regard to, to my personal path from architecture to anthropology. Um, before that, because I think, uh, and this is the main point of, of, uh, of this invitation and of this project, or so this program, or this podcast, I don't know how you want to frame this, uh, this event, but it's, it's the fact of architecture being a human right. And, and I, I struggled with that idea because the first time, and I will be very, very honest, the first thing that came to my mind was Marie Antoinette's famous sentence, although it's not, we don't know if effectively she was the one pronouncing it about uh, let them eat cake, because there are so many rights that should come first and were not yet addressed um, and so thinking about architecture seems a bit far-fetched. Of course, yeah. th of course, I then started thinking, this is not uh, an interesting answer. And this is, there are much more to it, of course. And so I started also thinking about who are the recipients of, of human rights. And I think uh -huh. there's one, one aspect, which is usually rights are enshrined in national constitutions. And so we only request or we only claim human rights by the moment we have no rights. And so we are talking about people who are seeking human rights because to, to fulfill their basic needs and because there is no normal circumstances in the context they lived previously. Of course, and with this, I, I, I moved forward because, and I tried to, to read, or I read actually, your manifesto. And, and then, and, and, we, and without any sort of disregard, because I think architects and architecture can play an, an extremely important role in this. And I was thinking about whether architecture is a human right or if, and I think this is the, perhaps my point here, is that architecture is a tool in order to attain a set of human rights, more than a human right in itself. Um, well, this is, these are my two cents to, to not, not only this, I hope, but but this is this is one thing and and there's one risk uh of um i see because i, I work with these days i work with uh, with refugees and refugee camps and so we see we we are aware of how ref, this, this refugee phenomenon these days this refugee crisis which is not a crisis in the end of the day we are uh, we're pretty sure about it um at least in the european context elsewhere is certainly different but is is that the multiplication of la of labels with regard to refugees, like uh, climate refugees, conflict, war refugees, um, actually has um, backlashed. And, and so sometimes it is important to stick to the more abstract. And in terms of legal frameworks, this is important. In terms of anthropological and architecture, it's totally the opposite. But in legal terms, you have to be as abstract as possible because this means that you are, will be as inclusive or the most inclusive possible and more universal possible. And so by the moment in answering again to the idea of freedom, yeah. it seems that 
the very idea of freedom is lacking because we always think about freedom of something, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of you name it, and of, of, of having an architect uh, next to you or you being an architect also, and, and, and the, the, the several differences and uh, options that can, can arise from, from this. And, and I think it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to, to understand how this um, the, the going into the concrete of law actually create exclusions. So the more abstract you stay, at, at least at the legal level, the more inclusive you will be. And then it also in this, in this spiral of, of thinking, I, I would say it's, a, it's very interesting because I was wondering what, what we mean by architecture. And I think this is a very key question in this, in this debate. Um, is architecture something that is made by architects? It is something that is related to the quality of a, a given building. Um, and so, I, and with this, I would like to have your feedback in order to better yeah. continue our our discussion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you mentioned both kind of that are like this kind of or like the quality. We had this debate about quality. I think already, like if it's what is the basic quality? Like if if a wall is if 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 you get a <coughs> a house for example which is like totally broken then I think it's not a basic quality that, that is like uh, needed for, for freedom or for, for health, for example, or having a community, without community spaces, you cannot develop a community, for example. I think it's very difficult. And the other one, so I think this is it. And the other one is architecture. I think it's simple about building spaces, building uh, spatial, like spatial development is architecture, I think. And who is doing it? I think everybody can do architecture, uh, architects and non-architects as well. The only question is the quality, I think. And maybe architects are, are, are taught to develop a quality, but without the user, they cannot uh, develop good quality architecture as well. So. No, no, yeah, certainly. That, <clears throat> that idea of the context and of the of the client, which is not always a client because you don't yeah. have a direct connection with him or her or with, with the group at least. But I, I think it's, it's quite interesting also to think about, I mean, the role of the doctor and the nurse. You are always saving the patient. You know, that's your purpose, regardless of him or her being a criminal or um, a prestigious philosopher, whatever, like it, it doesn't matter. You are always, your aim is always the same. And I think it's quite interesting because with architecture, as I was saying before, mm -hmm. you can, you can play this in, extremely important role. You, you are, uh, you can be the most important person in the process without showing yourself in, in the process. I mean, you, you're there, but the, the outcomes between the, the politicians that decided something and uh, ultimately the people that we will um, use those very spaces. The, the architect is, is somebody that can be present but also can be in the shadow. And I think this is very interesting how you, how you play with this because at the same time there are people, there are amazing people doing amazing stuff. You also have the, other, the opposite. And, and this, one of the things that you one of those guidelining uh, questions that you have sent me with regard to security. I think security is, is a very interesting example these days because at the same time that we are observing architects and not only architects once again, but people that are into designing space or into organizing space, which are architects, urban planners. Uh, there's a, a batch of people working in, in that in that dimension, and I think they are all important in um, in the end of the day. But it, it's also it's also how you the, the, the others that pr project and design uh, the gated communities, which in my view are very similar to with to, to refugee camps. 
um, they are like the sort of the the mirror expression of the refugee camp, in the sense yeah. that these people, at least in a theoretical, and I'm not validating their discourses. I'm just saying, yeah. or or the architect. The architect is, of course, he has to survive. So. Uh, you will work and your principles sometimes are secondary. I know I, it, it, it happens with everybody. It's not only with architects, mm. but it's, it's the, this moment in which you find yourself uh, following the idea of refuge, if we want to, to say it. And because you are, you need or you feel unsafe and because in your town, imagine if you live in, in Rio or in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, in, and so you seek refuge from urban violence, from pollution, from unhealthy lifestyles. Um, and the sort of discourse that you enact is very similar. And I'm not trying to compare at all. Like uh, yeah. we should be very careful with the, with with the words and how to to state these sort of things. Um, we cannot compare it with this with refugees. But the the, the idea of planning for refuge which is my nowadays the scope of my of my researches is is very interesting and we should deserve our our our, our time deserves our attention to this sort of of of, of narratives and how they they neutralize um between in in the end there's a moment in which you don't really understand what it it, it creates noise in the system because i i'm i'm fleeing violence because of a conflict because of climate change in uh i don't know from bangladesh and fleeing somewhere but also some rich guy in bangladesh will enact exactly the same discourse in order to to find his safe haven in a gated community with his helicopter and architects plan both the worlds yeah. Okay, my, may, may, my, I, my, may I ask like my, maybe one or two questions <laughs> no. about, about uh, yeah, practice? Yeah, yeah. So like, can we, this, I think this discussion is really nice, but can we translate it to the, to the real life, to the very reality in terms of, uh, of people, in terms of really like practice? So like you mentioned about, when you talked about architects and, and like patients and so on, and Africa, I think you mentioned refugee camps in your research. Maybe you didn't mention Africa, but like <clears> refugee <throat> camps. So uh, how, do you, how do you see it there in, on field? Well, I, I avoided actually the word Africa because it when used. Yeah. But, but yeah, in my research, I work in Africa. I work in Zambia, uh, Angola. Yeah. And now so I'm going to study right. conducting my research in Mozambique. But I, I always try to avoid the word Africa because it's not only... It's not a country, of course, but it, yeah. it also there's a, with this envelope, a lot of preconceptions and prejudice came on board. And so I, I always try to give examples from other latitudes, other geographies, yeah. which are mm -hmm. still valid in their abstraction, at yeah. least. Um, and this is only the reason why I didn't mention Africa so far. <laughs> it's not, yeah, but yeah, yes, no, I do. So, but how can we, how can we translate this, this previous discussion, yeah. like this last 10 minutes into Practice. Yeah. Okay. I, I'd say, I mean, we only have ten minutes. This is this is not possible. No, no, of course. But the, 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 <laughs> no. But the thing is, I mean, I understand when the ref, when refugee camps, and if if you are talking specifically about refugee camps, when architects, and there's a handbook by the UNHCR, and certainly other NGOs have their own handbooks in order to deploy a refugee camp uh, from one day to the other. Um, but the issue is that that solves the problem in like in the first two, three, four weeks, the first year. But the fact is, if you look at the, at the figures, um, you have situations of protected of, of protected refugees virtually everywhere today. And I'm not talking only about what is happening in the Middle East. You you go and check Africa. So. Um, and, and this poses a, a very interesting question in terms of practice, what you were mentioning, because mm -hmm. um, you are planning for the emergency. So it means that you have to, to create the very ephemeral structures uh, because they will last only the time of that war or that catas natural catastrophe to, to fight away. But 
we realize that sometimes 40 years on and people are still living there, not because the catastrophe, natural catastrophe is still lingering, but because the war is still happening or the remnants of, and, for, and now this would be quite complex to address and we, go, we had to go into each and every case. But the, the fact is that um, suddenly you cannot be planning and designing for the emergency. But you won't be welcome if you are planning for the for the longer term, because of course, hosting countries don't want uh, refugee camps forever. But once the refugee camp is settled, they are told this will fade away, will disappear, we will t tear apart the camp uh, once the emergency is over. And so, uh, the practice here is very difficult because. We're planning. What is the time span? What is the time span in this in this uh, in, in this sort of approach? And and we also see. And I mean, Bram Jansen just came up with a book recently this this year about humanitarian urbanism. Um, mm. And it's not only about the the organic uh, development of these these camps, but also their temporality. And what starts with tents goes on people with self constructing their own houses. Sometimes there are NGOs, or in most cases there are NGOs, depending on the place and depending on the context and, and so forth. But play also uh, contributing to this the urban the urban development. And but also people coming from the outside of the camp, which are not refugees or at least recognized as such. Um, and then you have. Not a camp, but you have a, a city, a humanitarian city. And, and this humanitarian city has different stages of development because it was, it was uh, since the, at the inception, it was uh, something for the emergency, then it became something stable and will endure in time. So the practice of architecture in there, I find it very tricky and it's certainly a challenge. So, mm. So I, I don't have a straightforward answer to your question, but practice in these cases is you have to consider these several stages from the emergency to the long term. How you do that, it's something I cannot answer you. I, <laughs> I, but I would but say as that- you see, like, uh, as you see maybe in camps or like, you know, like, as I see, first stage is always to have a tent, which is like a super fast. You can build it up <clears> even <throat> on your own in a few hours, maybe. So this is the very first stage. Then you start developing and maybe you get some bricks. So you start uh, building up a, a semi-brick, semi-tent house. Then it's going to be like a brick house. And then it's going to have like two floors or I don't know. And, uh, and it's going to have a, a bathroom or something like that. And, and yes, but I think what I find very interesting is welcoming, uh, welcoming feeling, like how to develop uh, uh, a feeling of welcome that you meant. You mentioned you get, you said something like this that is like very, very like uh, very interesting. Uh, I mean, topic. you know, sometimes like I, I, when again I I work in Africa, work with the Mongolians in in a Zambian refugee camp. And and sometimes you realize because these people um, live in circumstances in what we would say as material poverty, but actually the idea of poverty is is very centered in our own perspective about poverty and what is mm -hmm. scarcity and so forth. And even what is about being at home. I mean, we have lived abroad and sometimes it, it's enough to take uh, that music to feel at home try to you prepare that recipe that remembers of your of of your mother of your grandmother and you are at home so the idea of being at home and of being welcoming is 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 ambiguous and relative and it's very ex extremely subjective but in this specific case where i was where i was studying then again uh, angolan refugees in zambia and if you look at the map angola borders zambia or the other way around um Actually, many of these, and some authors wrote about this, that we, perhaps we should not consider these people as refugees, but as migrating villagers. And actually, it was, uh, was 
<clears throat> was only after Geneva, the, the Convention of 1951, later with the Protocol of New York and in 1967 and so forth, that you have this expansion and extension to other countries. But still, it's this, this idea of the, the creation of the legal, um, the legal figure of the refugee that creates the refugee and, and not so welcoming sometimes. Of course, we could, we could go on and discuss this. But what people were doing before the, this convention, the, the recognition of refugees as such, was that people were migrating from one territory to the other. Uh, by the moment you have a border and you have these conventions, they are no longer migrating villages, but they become refugees. And so even the, the perception, the local perception, but also the institutional perception with regard to these people that are arriving is different. And also, of course, the feeling of being welcome or not. Mm -hmm. And what we will, will we get from those people? Because if, if you want to go into the concrete, then again, refugees were amazing in this area. And I'm not saying this with any irony, because this meant that international agencies were there operating, roads were built um, suddenly in these refugee camps, which were in, settled in rural areas, but on any sort of access, suddenly had um, schools, training programs, clinics, and so forth. So it these camps and in, in this, this sort of, of humanitarian world that settled in this area um, brought some modernity to this to this place, and also the fact that many chiefs that lived in the Zambian on the Zambian side of the border that once the refugees arrived and were integrated by then not necessarily considered as refugees, but were integrated, they were populations, they were people. And people were, were capital. And, and these people meant that the central government had to, to, to better follow the, the situation. They could make more strong political claims in order to settle, to, um, to create a school, a clinic, uh, a road network. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting because we nowadays see refugees sometimes as problems or migrating mm. people as problems. And, and they can be both. I mean, it's a, uh, and even what is migrating people when, because the, the, the lifestyle, the, the, the sort of, um, of approach to, to the territory is very different than ours. And these people are not uh, nomads. These people are not, or at least most of the groups that live uh, along the borderlands, um, these people, have they, they they move from one place to the other um, as time goes by in order to reestablish restore the natural balance in order to find better lands to 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 grow their their agriculture produce in order to to fish and so this is very interesting because the, our conceptions sometimes have to be reframed. Uh, and even when in returning to the idea of planning, of, of creating infrastructures, of creating, of offering architecture to these, to these people, uh, or, or not only to this, but to any, anyone, you have to always bear in mind that the, their own cultural idiosyncrasies, their own cultural specificities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think this is the, high, the, the great contrast with law, with legal mm -hmm. frameworks, with regards to... Yeah. Uh, I mean, anthropology, uh, which I'm now engaged in, um, anthropology and architecture, you have to go to the ground, you have to the field, you have to talk with people, you have to be as concrete as possible, as specific as the most specific possible. Whereas in yeah, law, yeah, it's so this is why I think, uh -huh. and so this is why yeah, I'm so like quite reluctant rights, to accept. You know, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we are a bit like so. Also, the the human rights are on a legal, on a, on a theoretical level. This is functioning perfectly, but in reality, it it doesn't hurt more or less. No, at all. Sure. no. Like law offers you how life ought to be, and and come on, once you go to, <laughs> you know it. Like you don't have to go elsewhere. You you know your reality, yeah. and and despite the existing the existence of. Uh, a set of legal frameworks and, and specific bills that address this or that issue, they, they continue there, they remain there. And, and so there's this decalage, I mean, uh, 
this this sense of this dissonance i don't know how to put it and i think in this case architecture would have much to gain uh, actually by not following the law mm-hmm. by being subversive enough uh, by refusing to participate in certain political endeavors by building uh, and this is quite illustrative as we uh, when, uh, as we talk about walls, about gated communities, about these architectures of security in a more abstract, uh, yeah, broader sense. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if this I is think, conclusive, but... <laughs> no, no, but I think it's like, it's a kind of, a, let's say it's a kind of, a, even like a global trend that a lot of architects are, who are like more on the field of, of this kind of, basic human rights and architecture so they are offering spaces and quality for for communities with low income or i don't know uh, or minority groups they are somehow not following the 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 rules the 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 rules and the and the and the main the main legal ways so they are trying to find new new possibilities uh, which are still somehow legal but but somehow giving a new answer for for problems. No, no, yes. Uh, I mean, ar- architecture is a great tool. It's a, it's a great instrument to fight for human rights. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's, that's the, great, uh, the great thing about it because you can be subversive because it also, it's not only about the moment you design things and the way you might interact with people during the process of of, of designing and, and, and discussing with the political actors, with the local actors, with the communities, if that's the case. But it, by the moment, it's something that it remains there. It stays there. Um, and what is inscribed in that, in, codified in that, in, in that given building, um, I think this, this is the greatest thing of architecture. So this is why I mean that I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to think about architecture as a human right, but as a tool, as a, an extremely important tool that we could use and we should, we must use it to, to attain those human rights that are still lacking. And, mm-hmm. and I'm, yeah, we go, go on, sorry. On, on the topic of security, I think it's like, I would go for two things. In, in one hand, in the phenomenalist, I think the, 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 the Leopold Lambert, like the founder of the magazine, I think he is quite often talks about uh, of, of, of security and building walls or like police stations in France. They are almost like windowless buildings because they must be showing that they are very secure and very like about security and everything. And then he's like kind of uh, studying this, this kind of phenomenon of, of a wall building, which is like super secure, but in a, in other hand, it's also showing a kind of political force. So I think this is one topic that can be like I think could could develop could be developed. And the other one I think, which is, I would go for this one. It's about a question from Rebecca. She to, she asks about uh, secu- often security narrative become the so-called disciplinary architecture. I don't know what does that mean. Exactly, but yeah, and then we can see it in urban situations, but how does it look like in refugee contest? No, um, no, yes, because I mean, all these spaces are aimed at controlling people and managing people, refugee camps mainly. But if you go to the polling stations in France, but all the other uh, architectures of security, I I find it very interesting, this, this sort of inversion that we are observing these days. In which, for instance, former um, psychiatric wards become gated communities, for instance. And I, and I think because before there was this, this fear of the outside, um, or better, and, and people who were inside were protected. And more and more you see, you see this, this, this opposite, like the, that we should, instead of, of um, retaining the mad, the, the as a stereotype, like the, the, the mad guy that has been in, inserted and put in, in one of these institutions to be, to be controlled. Nowadays, we release them. And instead of being peacefully in the outside, 
um, we we do the opposite. We we remove ourselves from the outside and enclose ourselves in these gated communities, in these more fenced uh, architectural environments. And then suddenly the outside is where the mad people live. And I, I'm being very, I'm putting the things very in a very simplistic way, of course. This we could, we could continue discussing this. But I find this, this inversion very, very, very interesting. Because what we observe is this sort this emergency, this enclaves, mushrooming, in which people find different sorts of security, sometimes tangible, sometimes not so much. I mean, I, I tell you the case here in Lisbon. We had um, in one place, which is called, uh, one district that it is called Shellish, and a friend of mine that works in this, we were discussing this recently, and he was telling me this is completely full because we have a semi, semi-gated community. So you have the gate in the front, but if you go, um, you have the road in order to park your car in this gated community is open. And so this is a, a, more about the psychological props, psychological, all this theater, theater that we create and we rely on and depend on um, more than any sort of effective dangerosity on, on the ground because even if that dangerosity exists that that, that perilous outside exists um the the architectural that has been the architecture that has been created in these walls and so forth wouldn't be enough to actually protect you mm-hmm. um so it, it is why in the sense that i that i mentioned this is more at the psychological level than actually at the the, the the more tangible, uh, more concrete level of, of of life. You're not protected. You just feel that you are protected, yeah. and people right, believe so... that. Sorry, sorry. I, I, no, I'm sorry, but I, I like we are running out of time. So maybe as yeah. a last, uh, as a last few sentence, what would you? How would you, do? You have anything, anything in mind, which you must say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I don't know uh, what I must say. I mean, I think there's one thing that I'm that I'm pretty sure about, which is that whoever is a is is in is in a decisive um, role, or you have to go you have to go outside, you have to see the world, you have to see what what is happening on the ground, and and I think that most and not only with regard to architects, I mean this is this is pervasive. You see this in academia where I work. You have people that are writing papers from their offices without having, ever having set foot on the ground and knowing what is actually going on. And the same goes with politicians and so forth. The list is huge. So what I would recommend is actually, even if you think that this, that's the way to go or not, you have to go to the ground. You have to go and see with your own eyes. Live, go there, do some field work. And... And then, in the case of architecture, uh, perhaps you will be at least more prepared to to actually engage in something bigger, uh, projecting for the people, designing for the people with the people. And I think that I, I mean, I wasn't expecting like this key sentence that you with which no, you. No, no, it's not a key sentence. <laughs> I think it's, it's perfect. I think uh, you just cut it now, and it's great because, like, uh, uh, I think. We all look for we all look for some kind of. In one hand, we have our ideas, but in other hand, we are also looking for something like feedback that we are what we are doing is kind of makes sense. So, I think if someone is going to having this feeling that I should go out or or something or looking for an, uh, how to do it, I think this yeah. this can help. So yeah. I think it's great, even if it's a student or someone is trying to change yeah, yeah. a bit the, the, the profession or fed up with the mainstream architecture. I have more and more people coming with this issue of, okay, this mainstream architecture I'm doing now for years, it's, it's, it's fine, but it's, I'm over, I have to change it. So. No, yeah, yeah. L- leave the so, office, switch off the computer, switch off your mobile phone, see, see, see what, observe, talk with people. I mean, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The reality cool. is out there. Super. Okay. Thanks, Pedro. I think You're it welcome. was a nice discussion. Thank you very much, Pedro. And uh, we can watch it back and we will see that it was very good. <laughs> Thanks okay. a lot. Uh, see Thank you, you very time. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.